ఓం నమో బ్రహ్మాదిభ్యో బ్రహ్మ విద్యా సంప్రదాయ కర్తృభ్యో వంశ ఋషిభ్యో నమో మహద్భ్యో నమో గురుభ్య టుడే వి విల్ డిస్కస్ ఆన్ ద ఉపనిషత్స్ మెయిన్లీ విత్ ఫోకస్ ఆన్ శంకర భగవత్పాద హీస్ కామెంటరీస్ అండ్ ద కంట్రిబ్యూషన్ ఆఫ్ his commentaries to the development of upanishadic understanding before we jump into bhagavad pada and his commentaries as such we may have as a basis for that why bhagavad pada took such a way of interpretation as basis of that let us first contemplate on the vedic literature just for a while the enormous amount of corpus enormous corpus of vedic literature is something very mysterious in none of our known civilizations there is any parallel to the fact of the kind of vedic lit size and the content of vedic literature elsewhere in the given antiquity according to historians it is i will just make this point very clear without dwelling much on that taking a a fact into consideration that our own bhandarkar oriental research institute has published the vedic bibliography a dry list of the works and the articles written on vedic literature in the recent past for about say about 2 to 300 years runs into 4000 pages if that could be the case how much of interest it has created in the minds of critics and thinkers and scholars across the globe this is the secret of vedic lore this shows the importance of it not only this for the millions of millions of years there were so many individuals who have sacrificed only to protect the recitational akshara grahana and ucharana only recitational practice of the vedas even mostly without considering what they mean and how they are related with them just to protect the akshara rashi or shabda rashi the or the corpus of vedic literature thousands and thousands of years continuously family after family have devoted all their energies this also shows how important this genre called vedic literature is for us what is the secret of it i think if rigveda is the first available text of the humanity not of bharat india but for the entire vishva manavata for humanity the first text is available text is rigveda the time might have had a few more else elsewhere and somewhere we do not know about that and starting from the rigveda which is held to be the first available text of any civilization which is under the sun so far till the last upanishads there is a continuity continuum of thought which i want to highlight for a few seconds but before i go into that we should also know the history of vedic literature as such is given sometimes causes lot of confusions in putting the vedic thought in right perspective why i say this 
that Vedic Vedas is only one. There are no Vedas as such. Veda is only one and there are no divisions in the Veda. All the, the entire corpus called Veda has been classified into four by Veda Vyasa, one Veda Vyasa, whether he is an individual or school or whatever time he belongs to, but it is Veda Vyasa because for the last several centuries and thousands of years, we are believing it. We are doing Vyasa Puja. At least for the known 2000 year history, the, there are so many gurus in India who are doing Vyasa Puja only on Ashada Purnima who has divided the Veda into four parts first, that is Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda and Atharva Veda and then each Veda into four parts according to the content of the broadly. This is all, this is no watertight compartments, it is a broad division, broad classification he brought. Ever since the Veda Vyasa time only, we have got four Vedas and each Veda is again divided into four parts, so that four into four sixteen. Where in this line, Upanishad falls at the end. That's why sometimes it is called Veda Anta. Veda Anta. Veda Anta, sometimes literally speaking, end parts of the Veda also may hold good, but according to Shankara and other commentators, that is not the right meaning of Veda Anta. Anta word is the, the uh, Nirnaya, that is the decision and uh, purport of the Veda is called Anta. So Veda Anta, the ultimate purpose and purport of uh, Veda Rashi is the Vedanta. This is how Shankara and other commentators explain it. Incidentally, they are also the last part. There is a, a reason to be in the last. Now, if we go, if we make a, an observation of all the four parts of any given Veda. The Samhita part is mostly the collections of hymns, Rigveda having number of hymns more than any other Veda. The hymns, you, we can even see the development of thought. This is the secret of classifying them into four parts. How the, see any object we see, at, at first, the physical entity is experienced. This is the outermost viewpoint of seeing the nature around, seeing the cosmos around, seeing the entire world around is the, and enjoying it, maybe dismaying it, and maybe confusing it. There is a spontaneous poetry that has come in the form of Rigveda. So mostly we see in the Samhitas, the outermost part of the human existence, that is the nature. In all its subtleties, I am putting it in a very broad way, uh, I can't go into details. That's why Indra, Varuna, even Nadi, Ushas, and everything has become an object of prayer in the, at the time of the Rig Veda, which is in the development of thought, the first stage. Later on, for this very inexplicable and highly complicated natural phenomena, the human mind, the Rishi, the mind of the Rishis has traveled one step ahead and they started positing an Abhimani Devata behind every natural behind every uh, object of nature. Suppose if that is a, if river is prayed, it is not the river that is prayed, but the Abhimani Devata of river is prayed. They conceived the thought of positing a Devata as an Abhimani Devata for all the natural objects that have been observed and enjoyed and experienced has started somewhere around 
the time of end of the Samhita period. And then, once a Devata is contemplated, and once a Devata is held to be responsible for giving such a splendorous nature and their benefits to us, then a further development of thought took place, how to propitiate them, how to please them, and also how to worship them, and how to get more and more from them. This basic and feeling of a uh, community, Vedic community, has given rise to the various kinds of uh, rituals related to the uh, natural principles and their propitiating Abhimani Devatas. This is how the Yajna concept has come into and we give the same to Tvadiyam Vastu Govinda Tubhyameva Samarpaye. What ultimately is offered in the fire are water is given by nature, fire is given by nature and all other objects which we throw them into the fire during Yajna are also given by the object. So a part of it is given to the nature to derive it more. This is the basic understanding of the Brahmanic period. Therefore, the rituals have gone into various kinds. Then after doing lot of rituals, everything is uh, in excess, causes a kind of uh, further development and this further development ultimately who is this devata you know in kerno upanishad also the again that's why there is a continuum from the indra has not gone nowhere indra was there in the samhita indra was there main deity in the brahmanas during rituals and all and indra is again there in the upanishads nowhere he has gone Yama has not gone anywhere. Varuna has not gone anywhere. So, same Deva, the concept of nature developed into the Devata concept, Abhimani Devata concept, and later on, what is the Devata Tattva? First of all, a, what personified Devatas, and then a kind of Impersonification, impersonification took place in the minds of the Vedic Rishis. For example, if we go into the Mundakopanishad teaching, what has taken place is they have observed the outermost sharira as Sthola Sharira, which is enjoyed during Jagradavastha, and then they travelled to the Sukshma Avastha, that is a Swapna Avastha, and where the gross body is not felt, but some internal body, Sukshma Sharira, is felt. And then, if when we drop into the Sushupti Avastha, even the Sukshma Sharira is not experienced and only a kind of bliss and bliss alone is experienced, which has made the Rishi to contemplate the fourth level of consciousness, which is not in experience, but as a logical positivity, beyond the three levels of consciousness, there should be a further fourth level of consciousness, which is the root cause of all these consciousness. Therefore, the Turiya has been contemplated by the Maharishi. In the Turiya level, there is nothing, only bliss and bliss alone. If this could be the experience of every commoner, for by God's grace, this experience is universal. There is no east and west, there is no south and north, and even animals and other Kingdom also experienced the same. Uh, in fact, there were scientific inventions to say that even plants do have these levels of consciousness. Therefore, this is universal. In this universal experience, which is well described in Mundaka Upanishad, what is ultimately found by the Rishi is 
that at the root of everything of seemingly different world, there is only one that is Chaitanya Matra. It is only one bliss alone, Ananda Sat Chit Ananda, Sat Chit Ananda. These three words have come to come into our culture uh, till today and uh, we know Satchidananda and several people keep the name also for that fancy. That is, they, the, what remains is that there is, there is, is, is Sat. To experience it, it is a Chaitanya and it is nothing but bliss and bliss alone. This should be the root cause of the whole existence of every individual being. If this could be the every individual root cause of root exist, the uh, what you call ultimate exist, the form of the ultimate existence of is only Sat, Chit, and Ananda, then in the corresponding theory of cosmology, the same thing should be the case with the Brahman. Therefore, Brahman is also contemplated to be the Sat and Chit and Ananda alone without any qualities, attributes and other things whatsoever. This position, this thought which has started in the Rig Veda with the outermost observation of the universe from a middle stage of contemplating on the secrets of nature and responsibility went to gods and the god kingdom and, and all that in the brahmanas and that. and then it has taken a further travel to reach the ultimate point in the upanishads to to see that the ultimate reality is of the nature of satyam jnanam anantam brahma this is the definition given to the Brahman uh, in the Upanishads. We must note that in the Upanishads, we never speak of Ishwara. There is no God at all. God plays a very, very minimal role in the Upanishads. Uh, and it is only called Brahman. What is the, what is the meaning of the Brahman? Brahatvat, Brahmanatvadva, Atma, Brahmiti, Giyate. Either it should be too big, and it has entered into every, every in the sense to the Paramanu level to Parvata level in every uh, object that is also Antaryami. Prahatvat Brahmanadvadva Atma Brahmeti Giyate. And then one more step ahead they have, Shankara has taken it to a further uh, a level of thought that is, this Atman of individual, of all of us, which is experienced every day by us in four levels, is none but the Brahman itself. This is what is called the quintessence of Advaita Vedantic standpoint. So if we see in this sequence, there is a logical development of thought and there is a uh, progressive thought of development which has resulted in the uh, Vedantic, Shankara's Advaitic, mono, monistic philosophy of Upanishads. So, what I wanted to make it clear is that there is a continuum of all four stages of Vedic literature that is Samhita, Brahmanas, Aranyakas and then Upanishads. And also, it is only a thought from the outermost perspective to the innermost perspective of every object in the world. Not only ourselves, not only every objective, every object, this is the secret of every object. Once it has been realized, the rituals have become meaningless and there are several passages in the Upanishads condemning the or rituals, karmakanda, like anything in the Upanishads. It's very astonishing because it is a kind of self-defeat exercise because Brahmanas are also part of the Veda. 
which prescribe so many rituals. So it is a kind of self-defeating exercise also, we may think lightly, but until and unless this Karmakanda, uh, one more thing I want to submit, you see the major portion of the Rigveda, I told you the enormous amount of quantum of Vedic literature in the beginning. And 90 to 95 percent of the whole literature is related with Devata concept and also karma concept and rituals and all that. Only 10 or 5 percent of the last portions are the Vedanta which have overpowered the previous uh, entire corpus of uh, Vedic literature. That means there is some, uh, this is the secret and charm of the Upanishads. So Mundaka says, Pravahyete adrudha yajna rupa. All these yajnas and rituals are just like small boats which will help us to go into the sea, go into the river, go into the pond only to a limited extent. You can't even cross it. If you take a small boat, all the best you can do is you can have a round, you can go to a, some extent, go to a particular distance and then you have to come back because you cannot cross the river with the help of small boat. It needs a big boat or ship or something like that. The case of the oceans is something very different. So, pravaha, prava means just the smallest possible uh, object of crossing the water and all that. These are adridhaha. There is no strength in them. They cannot lead you, they cannot take you far. You have to return to your shore. Similarly, by doing the yajnas, uh, one more Upanishad says, Kapuya Charana, Kapuna, Kapuyam Yoni Mahapadyante, Ramaniya Charana, Ramaniyam Yoni Mahapadyante. You have to, after the enjoying the fruits of Swarga and all those benefits of uh, doing the karmas, you have to come again and take rebirth and enjoy the sorrow, happiness or sorrow according to your Sanchita Karma or Prarabdha Karma. This is very clear in the Vedic. Uh, understanding. Therefore, they felt that the yajnas and rituals will not take us too far. They are only very intermediary. That's why they have etat chrayon avidyayam antare vartamanah svayam dhiraf panditam manyamanah dandram yamana pariyanti moodhah andhena eva niyamana yathandha. There are so many passages excessively criticizing the Karmakanda in the uh, Vedanta portions or Upanishadic portions of the Vedas. But it is to the credit of Shankar Bhagavad Pada who has made both because of the condemnation both have been given proper place. That is the genius of Shankar Bhagavad Pada. Till today in all the schools of in all our so-called Astika communities, Astika communities in the sense Asti, there is, I mean, pram, those who accept the Pramanita, Pramanikata or authority of the Vedas are called Astikas, immaterial whatever be their caste and all that. All of them are Astikas. Those who accept the uh, Pramanikata or authority of the Ved Vedic lore. Therefore, all the astikas, even today, this Karmakanda and the Janaganda, they observe them both hand in hand only because of Shankar Bhagavad Pada's intervention. And why that it is so? Did Bhagavad Pada do it from his mind or his whims and fancy? No. There is our age old tradition in our sacred land that. Tattu Samanvaya. This sutra is given by Badarayana Maharshi. In the, this is the fourth sutra of Brahma Sutras or Sharir Kamimamsa Sutras. That is Tattu Samanvaya. Our point of view is everything has to be made into a coherent theory. That's why whether it be in the Vedas, whether it be in the uh, Puranas, 
whether in the caste system, social system, political system, anywhere in Indian perspective, if you see, there is always an effort of putting everything into a coherent theory. You can't, oh, this is not favorable and let us cut the limb and throw it away. No, it's not like that. So, the more majority of the Vedic texts will become null and void, provided if you really believe that uh, dandramyamana paryanti mudha andhe niyamana yathanda, if you give too much importance than what it deserves to be given, then it will be mola cheda. You are condemning your own Vedic lore. Therefore, it is similarly in the Upanishadic texts also, you find number of sentences mutually strictly contradicting each other. On one hand, Dvasuparna Sayuja Sakhaya Samanam Ruksham Parishaswajati Tayo Ranyaf Pippalam Swadvati Anastin Nanyaha Abhichaka Siti. On one hand, it is clearly spoken, it is clearly told that there are two individuals, not one, sitting on the same branch of the tree. That is Jivatma and Paramatma. This mantra cannot be explained according to Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, in a proper way because Advaita Vedanta believes only in one Atman, not two Atmans. Clear statement is there. And similarly, clear statement is there that it is Tattvamasi. Identity also spoken not one time, two times, three times and four times, but nine times the identity of Jivatman and Paramatman is established in the Chandogya. That is Chandogya Shastadhyaya, very famous for Mahavakya called Tattvamasi. Therefore, how to reconcile again these two? So, Badarayana Maharshi showed the way of Tattu Samanvayat and Shankara Bhagavatpada completed the mission of summon, making Samanvaya of all warring ideas, all warring contradictory ideas. To how to, the, one has to find a way to eliminate the contradiction. The statements may be mutually contradictory, but we can make an effort to eliminate the contradiction between them by proposing a theory by following which theory, everything will fall in its place in a coherent way. This is what Shankara Bhagavatpada has shown us the way until today we are leading the society. Our great nation is knowingly or unknowingly following the same path. That is the, uh, that's why we have repeatedly say, Yekata in Vividhata. There is a lot of variety of uh, human beings, religions, and this and that, castes and subcastes, and so many divisions among our society, but Bharatiya society is only remained to be one and the same. I mean, even today, this somewhat this position and this perspective has not uh, gone away from our minds. That's why we are still uh, progressing in our own way. Then A word on a revelation, or maybe not out of the way. I will come back to Shankar Bhagavatpada's commentary. So this is this is how we should understand the development of Advaitic theory right from the Vedas. When I say Upanishads do have the philosophical this one, it's not. It's only dominant feature of Samhita is the outside world. Bahir, bahif prapancha, everywhere it is only dominance, taking the dominance into consideration, we say that. But there are inputs of Advaitic ideas, even in the Samhitas, and there are inputs of uh, karma and their relevance also in the later part of Upanishads and all that. All this enormous corpus, where from how it came, who is the author of this, we never contemplated any other of the Vedas and the Upanishads. We call them revealed texts, that is, Apaurusheya Granthas. See, we are very clear. None says that Mahabharata is Apaurusheya, however great it may be, however important it may be for us. It may be more important to us than Upanishads. But we never say Ramayana is 
అపౌరుషయ్య భగవాన్ రామచంద్ర ఇట్ ఈస్ ఎ వెరీ గ్రేట్ వర్షి వెల్ వర్షిప్డ్ రిలీజియస్ టెక్స్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా త్రూ అవుట్ ద బ్రెత్ అండ్ లెంగ్త్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా బట్ వీ నెవర్ సే దట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ రామాయణ ఈజ్ అపౌరుషయ్య ఈవెన్ దో ద ఎపిసోడ్ ఆఫ్ అపౌరుషయ్య ఈజ్ దేర్ దట్ శోక శ్లోకత్వం ఆగత ఇట్ ఈస్ ఎ స్పాంటేనిటీ వితౌట్ ఎనీ ఏజెన్సీ ఆఫ్ వాల్మీకి మహర్షి వాల్మీకి ఇట్ హ్యాస్ కమ్ అవుట్ ఇన్ ద రామాయణ యాజ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ రికార్డెడ్ ఇన్ ద సేమ్ ఎపిక్ డిస్పైట్ ద ఫ్యాక్ట్ దట్ ఇట్ ఈ ఇట్ ఈక్వల్స్ టు ద పౌరుషయ్య బికాస్ అల్టిమేట్లీ వీ మస్ట్ అండర్స్టాండ్ ఇన్ ఎ క్రిటికల్ మ్యానర్ వాట్ ఈస్ మెంట్ బై అపౌరుషయ్య ద టర్మ్ అపౌరుషయ్య ఈజ్ ఓన్లీ దాట్ దేర్ షుడ్ నాట్ బీ ఎనీ హ్యూమన్ ఇంటెల్ ఏజెన్సీ ఇన్ ఇన్వెంటింగ్ ఆర్ ఇన్ రైటింగ్ ఆర్ ఇన్ ప్రొనౌన్సింగ్ అండ్ ఆర్ ఇన్ డూయింగ్ ఎనీథింగ్ if that happens it is only beyond the purusha or sphere beyond the uh, purusha's uh, sphere that is called apaurusheya therefore in one sense broadly speaking every great invention is also a an apaurusheya episode only then acharya shankara calls uh, now we understood the importance of shankara bhagavat padas catching the advaita Advaita is not invented or propounded by Shankara Bhagavad Pada. He was only systematized it. Not even he systematized it. The entire Upanishad lore, which is also very large in its corpus, is systematized first by Bhadrayana Maharshi, by Brahma Sutras. Interestingly, the Brahma Sutras are also called Shariraka Mimamsa Sutras. Actually, it is Shariraka Mimamsa Sutras. Uh, if we go to uh, the manuscripts and the real name of the brahma sutras is only sharirak mimamsa the even mimamsa darshana is also sharirak mimamsa darshana not vedanta darshana or anything the secret lies here what what is all about uh, the vedanta it is all about the sharirakha who dwells inside this body sharirakha means sharire bhavah sharirakha sharire within the body of gross body of our selves every creature on this surface of earth it is related to the essential nature of every physical object and every living being under the sun that's why it is specifically named carefully named as sharirika mimamsa bhashya or sharirika mimamsa sutras we for some reason because they also deal with the brahman we call it brahma sutras once we say brahma sutras we feel that it, they are not related to us but if we say we understand the other term sharirika mimamsa we can as well feel that it is more related to us only because according to badrayana there is no difference between the sharirika and the brahman whatever be the essential nature of the jeevatman of every living creature every living organism not only humans not only humans every living organism how tiny it may be how small it may be how insignificant it may be the real nature of that individual is the real nature of the cosmos that's why this advaitic view point has taken place now uh, bhagavad pada what is upanishad artha he says upanishad shabde na cha విద్యా ఉచ్యతే ఓన్లీ బ్రహ్మ విద్య ఈజ్ నోన్ టు బి ఉపనిషత్ విద్య ద నాలెడ్జ్ విచ్ నాలెడ్జ్ వ్యాచిఖ్యాసిత గ్రంథ ప్రతిపాద్య వేద్య వస్తు విషయా విద్య ఇన్ తైత్రియ ఇన్ కఠోపనిషత్ హీ సేస్ లైక్ దిస్ వ్యాచిఖ్యాసిత యో ద టెక్స్ట్ దట్ ఈస్ టు బి దట్ హ్యాస్ బీన్ టేకన్ టు కామెంట్ అపాన్ ఈజ్ కఠోపనిషత్ టెక్స్ట్ and what is the vastu that is ob, what what is the purport offered through the text that is brahman so brahma vishayaka vidya is called brahma vidya that is upanishad again in taitriyaka he repeatedly says upanishad iti vidyochyate why tat sevinam garbha janma jaradi nishatana there are three words comprising the uh the word upanishad upa ni and shad shad is the root upani are the upasargas 
upa always means to be nearer ni is a nischaya or nirnaya so the person who sits at the feet of the guru and takes the upadesha with a positive mind for him shad shadlu visharana gati avasadaneshu either it will it will make his samsara a oh, effect, uh, effectless or destroys it or it will lead him to the brahman realization visharana gati avasadana it also destroys all his previous karmas and liberates him from the cycle of birth and death that is avasadana so taking the root actually this is the charm of the shankara bhagavat pada's commentary because i am asked specifically to focus on that bhagavat pada never gives the purport meaning of any word neither in upanishad bhashya nor in gita bhashya but gives only the meaning that is derivable on the basis of prakriti pratyaya vibhaga and on the basis of panini's grammar this is the way he has shown to the commentators how we should be this is what i consider is the absolute honesty in commenting the text because i am not meddling with it upanishad are there shad according to panini sutra kibanta so shad root has got three meanings now it is my job how these three meanings are interpreted in the context of the vedas only there i come into the picture but not in the upani and the shad similarly bhagavat pada is very careful in commenting this um, gita bhashya is more so charmingly uh, pratipadartha and, and that pratipadartha word to word meaning is also always based on the panini's system of vyakarana and all that he never goes beyond that of course there afterwards he gives his own purposeful mean for example i will draw your attention anejat ekam manaso javiyo anejat see the shankara bhagavat pada comments for a small elementary student uh, for, for meaning elementary students i believe anejat na ejat first he shows the naithat purusha samasa and then he says yejuru company the panini has given the meaning of yejuru dhatu root as a kampana and kampanam means what it is chalanam movement therefore move what is the movement movement means swavastha pratyuti further definition of kampana any object that comes that uh, takes the kampana that takes movement leaves the uh, pradesha of previous and goes into the other pradesha uh, uh, then uh, kampanam chalanam Swa- chalanam means swavastha pratyuti to uh, okay it's very difficult to translate these things extempore up to this you know there is no meddling with the word tadejat anejat then tadvarjitam now he says sarvada eka roopam ityartha ityartha is purposeful meaning what does the upanishad desire to say is that it has no vikara at all it has no change at all so this is the concept of kotastha later on developed into the advaitic philosophy the kotastha chaitanya that is kotavat tishthati there is no aparinami swabhava one of the characteristics of the shuddha brahman is aparinamitva all of objects in this universe other than the brahman other than the chaitanya are parinami swabhavas if any object is born it will grow it will decay it will die so parinami swabhava to counter posit this parinami there should be an aparinami swabhava there should be an aparinami tattva that is the brahma tattva so from anijat he will take us to the kotastha concept and also aparinami concept but it's only after explaining the word to word meaning 
తచ్చ ఏకం సర్వభూతేషు అనే జదేకం మనసో జవీయ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఫాస్టర్ దాన్ మనస్ మనస్ ఈజ్ హెల్డ్ టు బి టూ ఫాస్ట్ బికాస్ ఐ కెన్ జస్ట్ నో ఇమ్మీడియట్లీ గో టు ఢిల్లీ అండ్ కమ్ బ్యాక్ వైల్ స్పీకింగ్ ఆల్సో సచ్ ఈస్ ద స్పీడ్ ఆఫ్ ద మనస్ బట్ అట్ ద సేమ్ టైమ్ దిస్ ఆత్మన్ ఈజ్ గ్రేట్లీ స్పీడర్ స్పీడియర్ దాన్ ద మనస్ ఆల్సో then he asks now he starts his discussion katham viruddha muchyate now he makes a small discussion okay you have told on one hand anejat and you are again telling that it it runs fast than the manas then how come the looks to be the vedic text looks to be very odd very confusing ha dhruvam nischalam idam manaso javi iti katham viruddha muchyate naisha dosha this is not a big problem nirupadhi upadhi matvena upapatte all such contradictions can be explained away that taking recourse to the sopadhika swarupa and nirupadhika swarupa if i take myself as sopadhika swarupa i am kutumba shastri i am son of so and so so and so i have got all my characteristics and all that but when i go into deep sleep during the night i don't have kutumba shastri with me i don't have anybody i am not related to anybody my swarupa is something different so there for every object of the world there is a sopadhi swarupa and nirupad this is one methodology bhagavad pada has given to understand the mutually contradicting statements of the upanishads therefore uh, i must uh, say uh, boldly that i think whether skanda swami is earlier than భగవత్ పాద ఆర్ భగవత్ పాద ఈజ్ ఎర్లియర్ దాన్ స్కంద స్వామి డేట్స్ ఆర్ కన్ఫ్యూజింగ్ అండ్ నథింగ్ ఈజ్ సెటిల్డ్ ఇన్ ఇండియన్ హ్యాస్ ఫర్ ఎస్ సంస్కృత హిస్టరీ ఆఫ్ సంస్కృత లిటరేచర్ ఈజ్ కన్సర్న్ దేర్ ఫోర్ శంకర్ భగవత్ పాద ఈజ్ ద ఫస్ట్ అండ్ ఫోర్ మోస్ట్ పర్సన్ టు షో ద వే హౌ టు ఇంటర్ప్రిట్ హౌ టు కామెంట్ ద వేదాస్ ఆల్సో దట్స్ వై దిస్ సేమ్ లైన్ ఆఫ్ థాట్ ఈజ్ కంటిన్యూడ్ బై అదర్ వేదిక్ కామెంటేటర్స్ till shayana and beyond shayana also so in this way also bhagavad pada is very important of course bhagavad pada's importance and his avatara has given us so much of uh, this entire land was a great deal to him for reviving our vedic thought at one time vedic thought was in shambles because of the seemingly people could not understand people did not develop the samanvaya drishti people thought it is all madness it is all something reckless and there is no meaning behind these statements it is bhagavat pada who brought it again back and showed us the right way to follow and he commented on 10 upanishads and those 10 upanishads and he followed the advaita theory of monistic uh, uh, purely based on the upanishads in which dualistic po- think theories can also be accommodated as long as one is under the uh, sphere of avidya one as long as one is under the sphere of avidya karma is meaningful and god is meaningful worshiping the god is meaningful and doing the rituals is also meaningful all dvaita prapancha remains and continues to be so for every as for other school people only when this avidya uh, the once realization takes place that i am the brahman i am brahmasmi as declared in the brahmadaranyaka then everything disappears and only advaita that remains i think this is the uh, major contribution of shankar bhagavad pada